It's always cool being back at BBC, and um, it's just uh, a neat city to be from, too. St. Louis is a cool city, and uh, we're starting a church this, uh, matter of fact, we've already had, this, this Saturday's our second uh, service, and so uh, we're looking forward to starting more, and so I need some more hands on deck to do that. So uh, as Reality uh, Lighthouse is really the only active fellowship church in St. Louis County and over a million and a half people. We need to change that. We're losing our big cities in America, aren't we? So uh, go and, and spend your life in making it count. Um, I live about two miles from the airport and uh, we, we live in a nice home. It's not the Conrad Hilton, but it's not living next door to Grandma Moses either, if you know what I mean. And, and um, God's blessed us with this really big walnut tree that is like right outside our, our bedroom window. And about this time of year, there's always uh, walnuts that fall. They only fall between 11 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning. And so it, it's like they hit the house and it sounds like a shotgun going off when it hits a roof. Now, I, I sleep really light. I'm a light sleeper. I can generally hear if a grasshopper flutters its wings out in the yard, I can generally hear that. My wife, no, she's a, when the rapture happens, she'll go, but she won't know about it for a couple hours yet, you know. <laughs> so last night it was raining, and I knew I had to get up and leave by five, and man, I felt like I, I felt like I experienced the Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day massacre and with all those Walnuts pounding off my off the roof last night. So, if I fall asleep, you wake me up. Usually, my folks tell me that's the best hour of sleep they get on Sunday morning. So maybe we'll all sleep together this morning. But you know, I really like coming to BBC and speaking because most of my ministry is about winning one soul at a time. And 31 years, you generally get enough in a congregation if you do the right thing and and try to do more. But when I come to BBC, it's like it's like speaking in multiplications because every one of you are going to have incredible ministries and the impact that you have in your life is going to be absolutely amazing. So I really cherish the opportunity to be here. And I don't have a, like a standard message that I'm preaching this morning for you. This isn't like a sugar stick that I preached uh, you know, last year in some conference someplace. This is a message that I've made especially for you and it's called Choosing Wisely. And it's about as a single person, who you choose to marry. Now, if you're married here this morning, get over it, all right? Because uh, you hear all these messages on marriage and all the singles have to sit and endure listening to stuff that doesn't pertain to them yet, you know, and all that. But this is going to be a message just primarily for single people. How about that? Anybody give me up for that? There you go, all right. Let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Thanks, Lord, for the blessing of being here today and for the joy of spending time with with these uh, life changers. And I pray, Lord, that you would multiply their efforts in the days that you give us together to serve you. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. The German philosopher and scholar Moses Mendenhall was an amazing man. He was known for all his brilliant, humble sayings and so forth. But he was also a hunchback. And uh, he was wise and beyond his years. And even as a young man, he went one day on a trip to Hamburg in Germany. And Mendenhall uh, met a very rich merchant. And in the merchant, he, as he met the merchant, he met his beautiful daughter, whose name was Funti. And he instantly fell in love with her at first sight. Uh, He saw her gentleness and kindness. And she saw him too, and she really was taken by him because of his wisdom. But there was this problem that he had. Mendenhall was a hunchback. And so he spent several weeks longer than he was planning in Hamburg. And he really loved this gal, instantly in love with her. But um, he just knew he didn't have a chance with her. And so he talked to her father, and he knew it was either uh, this or nothing. And so he talked to her and asked if he could have her, his daughter's hand in marriage. And, and he kind of held back and he said, you know, I know that in Germany you're considered to be one of the most brilliant young men and, 
And yet I have to tell you that my daughter, my only child, she was really kind of taken back by you, kind of afraid when she first saw you. And then he paused, kind of an awkward pause, and the minutes all said, because of my hunchback, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, he said, it probably won't work, but he said, can I have just one last time with your doc- daughter and talk to her? And, and he goes, certainly, yeah, that'll be fine. And so he went, and she was in the receiving room there, and she was uh, needle pointing and, and all that. And as the story goes, a true story, that he uh, talked about various matters and, and carefully and gradually led the story to the conversation that he wanted to talk about. And he finally got the heart up to ask her a question. And he said, do you believe that marriages are made in heaven? She said, yes. That's, that's what our faith teaches. And he goes, and rightfully so, it's true. Now let me tell you about something that's strange that happened when I, when I was born. He goes, as you know, when a child's born, according to our tradition, in heaven they call out the birth of that child. And if, uh, if it's a child that is a male, then they holler out also the name of the girl that he's going to marry. And so uh, imagine with me, the day I was born, I, I remember them announcing my name and it caught my attention. And then they announced the name of the girl that I was to marry. Flumti, he said. He said, and then I heard someone shout from a distance, that's too bad, that poor girl is going to be a hunchback. And he said, when I heard that, I immediately cried and said, oh God, if the girl's a hunchback, she's going to grow up bitter and hard, and it'll be a very difficult thing. Lord, give me the hunchback, if you would. Let her be a a lovely lady with character and, and ability and charming. Well, the story goes, a true story, that she actually married him. They lived a long and fruitful life together. Kind of a romantic story. It's kind of expecting an ah kind of thought, you know. But is it true? Is it true that marriages are really made in heaven? This morning I want to talk to you about choosing wisely. Is there someone out there who's picked out especially just for you? If you look at the polls, 85% of young people between the ages of 18 and 24, how many are in that range right there? Raise your hand, okay. 85% that they believe that every person has a perfect match. In other words, they're saying that they believe that the potential for a happy marriage is to be prearranged probably by God. But is it biblical teaching? Is that what the Bible teaches? The scripture doesn't tell us that that would be true. Probably more than not, it's not true. It's kind of comforting to think that everybody has a perfect mate, and obviously it's very appealing for people. But with the exception of Adam and Eve, nowhere in Scripture does it point out that this man was made for the perfect person for this woman. However, in the story that we're going to talk about in Genesis chapter 24 this morning, we're going to hear the story of Isaiah of Isaac and Rebekah. And it's going to illustrate that while marriages aren't made in heaven, under right circumstances, God can and God will help us pick the right person to have the perfect match. Are you interested in that? I think I would be if I was sitting where you are. By the way, I I married a Rebecca too. This is Rebecca Hudson was her name when we met here at Baptist Bible College. Um... I call her Hudson. That's kind of like my love name for her, like Sweetie and Honey Putt and all that kind of stuff. Actually, when we first got married, I put her on probation. I said, you can't really have the Gilmean name, so you have to earn it. For five years, you're on probation. You're Hudson. We got to five years, and I put it and extended it to ten years. After ten years, she said, I don't want your name anyway, you know. So we've been married 37 years, and one of the blessings of having two children is that they've given us three grandchildren. And the next slide kind of shows my three grandkids, Owen, Hudson, and, and little Piper. And we love them. But what kind of circumstances would cause God to help us seek out the right person? Well, most obviously, God has to be at the center of this story. That's what we're going to find in Genesis chapter 24. 
Abraham has made a decision to send a servant back to Aram Naharam, and he's going to give him the responsibility of picking out a wife for his son Isaac. Now, how many of y'all would like your grandparents picking out your spouse? Not so much, would you? Listen to what it says in Genesis 24, verse 7. Abraham said, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. It was a promise from God, wasn't it? God would promise that Isaac was going to have children, and so Isaac needed a wife. The women of Canaan that they lived in were very ungodly women. And so Abraham had the belief that the best place to get a wife was from his hometown, from his home country. And so this servant, as the text explained to us, is looking for help from God. And he's wanting God to help show the right person. The story continues, verse 12 through 14. It says this, O Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today. And show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring, and the waters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and, I, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. It's quite an incredible story if you think about it, isn't it? Boy, that servant kind of lays it on God. What is going to be the choice? He kind of makes a situation. God, if you want this to happen, then this needs to happen. Now, you also have to consider what Isaac was doing while his servant was gone. We read this a little bit later and toward the end of the story in verse 63 when it says, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. Isaac was out in the field. He was meditating. What, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that he was humming some you know, indistinct kind of tune or, tune or singing kumbaya. He was out there talking to God. He was meditating to God. He was, he was thinking, what kind of a gal is this servant of my dad's going to bring back to me? But he was talking with God. And so it would seem that Isaac's entire household... Not just his dad, but he himself, his servant, believed that the success of finding Isaac's future bride hinged entirely upon God. Do you believe that this morning? I believe if you want the perfect person, God needs to be in that equation. Biblically, that makes sense, doesn't it? We read in James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, You lust and you have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war. Yet you have not because you, what? Ask not. It goes on later to say that you have not because you ask amiss. You ask for the wrong things. So it ought to be obvious that if we want to involve God, that we ought to be wanting to involve God in finding this perfect mate for our life. Because God has what's best for us at heart, doesn't he? It might be wise to get involved in this process Sooner than later, I might explain too. So, before we get dating, one of the first principles that God gives us from his word is that we have a God consciousness about what's going on with all this. That we're thinking about this, not from our viewpoint, but, but what does God want in this situation? Now, I know when you came into chapel this morning, you weren't expecting a, a message like this, and you might think, who is this guy that really qualifies to tell me who I'm supposed to date and ultimately marry? I, I basically grew up around Baptist Bible College. Uh, my folks in 1949 moved, 1959 moved to Springfield, Missouri. And I was just a kid. I was born in Canada, but we came here. And I really grew up in Springfield, grew up around, around BBC. I uh, knew the great patriarchs of our fellowship. Dr. G. Beecham Vick was in our house. And as a kid, I remember his jolly spirit as they would play 42 with dominoes. And they'd tell the kids to get out of the room. But there was something about seeing them. My wife and I, when we were dating, uh, we came in the, the afternoon that Brother Vick passed away. His office was right behind that wall. And we came up there. My dad was the academic dean. 
and we saw Dr. Vic laying on the floor. I, I grew up around this place. I remember Fred Niffy Donaldson, Mr. Missions, the strong right arm of the Baptist Bible Fellowship is going to be missions. I remember hearing him say those words. I mowed Noel Smith's yard. I had two brothers, and we lived about a half mile from Noel Smith, and so we would drag our lawnmower down there. And the three of us, you can only have one mow, so one would mow, but he would pay all three of us as if we mowed it individually. He was a very kind man. And his wife, Willa Dean, would make us cookies. I, I knew these, these patriarchs of our fellowship like they were just normal people at the time, but they began to be revered in my life. My dad started a little church in a garage. Uh, it was called Airwood Baptist Church at the time. Then it later moved over on Cherry Street, Cherry Street Baptist. It was actually in, in Carol Stern's as a garage, you know, uh, Bill and Carol Leberga. It was in her garage, and I was saved in that garage in 1961. Sometimes my mom would say to me, were you born in a barn? And I go, no, but I was saved in a garage, you know. <laughs> and so as a kid, I remember growing up with some of the famous preachers in our fellowship. They were famous to me long before they had any kind of nobility. Long before there was a paycheck in it, they were serving God. Men like my youth pastor, Harold Brown in Somerset, Kentucky, or Ken McCormick in the incredible Tri-City Baptist Temple of Portland, Oregon. Missionaries like Don and Nancy Nevels. Les Garner uh, took care of Junior Church and one of my first assignments was leading singing in Junior Church with Les Garner. Can you imagine that? A great missionary. I knew these people. I ran with John Connor up as a kid when his folks would come back either first of all from Ethiopia or from, or from Kenya. Just childhood friends. I knew Pastor Phil Housley when he was a kid. His folks were in my church in St. Louis. Long before he was pastor of the Great Park Crest Baptist Church. And all these, all these people had one thing in common. And I could, honestly, I could go on and on and on about people who came through Baptist Bible College who eventually became great men and women of God. And they had one thing in, conscious, in, in common, is that they had a God consciousness about how that their life mattered and they carried that on in the realm of who they were going to spend the rest of their life with. <clears throat> Here, here's kind of how it goes. My twin brother, Ken, served in Cherry Street for 32 years. And he was youth pastor. Then he was the, the college pastor and so forth. And we've talked about this several times. What happens in a school is that sometimes we begin to date and we remembered when we were here at Bible College and you begin to date and you begin to invest a lot of time in a certain person and as you grow in this time relationship what you find out is that maybe we're not exactly fit for each other but we've put so much time together well to break up and start over again wow that's a hassle and if you don't like conflict and all that goes with it and sometimes what happens is that you you put in your time and you marry someone that maybe God had, doesn't have for you. I don't, I don't know your life. I'm not orchestrating your life. But I've seen this happen to where they settle for somebody that they were infatuated at first. But then what happened is that as it went on, they didn't have the courage to stop it, to find someone that was really for them. And in essence, they married someone less when they could have married someone that would, been, would have been the best. I want to ask you a question this morning. I don't mean to be in your face. How many of y'all plan on being in full-time ministry, either as a pastor, a pastor's wife, missionary, or missionary's wife? Would you raise your hand? Raise them nice and high. Okay. That is not an occupation. That's a calling, isn't it? And it is a calling that demands your whole heart. Um. I hope you'll listen to me. I, I don't mean to preach at you. That's kind of what I do, though, sometimes, all right? But if, you, if the Lord chooses for you to be married, and you don't marry somebody who is really good, I'm, I'm talking about has a heart for God, has a God consciousness, then please hear me. You will never be successful in the ministry. The ministry is way too hard 
to drag dead weight with you. You, you know, ministry is about taking ground. It's not about dabbling in all these little kind of vices and seeing what we can get away with as Christians. We are, we are way past that. We're about taking ground. We want that mountain, man. We are Caleb, aren't we? We're trying to do our best to conquer. And you can't do that if the person that is beside you is not in this lock, stock, and barrel. They have to be with a whole heart given for God. And you'll have to find that out. I've seen lots of very, very talented men never amount to anything because they married the wrong person. I've seen incredibly godly and strong women being trapped in a, in a ministry that is struggling, not that ministries don't struggle, but struggling all their life because they didn't marry a hardworking, godly man that could have changed the world. So I want to challenge you. Don't just marry somebody who will love you. Marry someone who will make you better. Someone who will make you into a champion for Christ that will conquer the world. The three most important decisions in life. First one, salvation, isn't it? That's where you'll give your spiritual heart. Who you marry, that's where you put your physical heart. And where you go to college, that's where you lay your intellectual heart. Now, I believe if I look at that list that you're doing really good on one and three, all right? You're, you're saved, anybody saved in this room? Okay, a couple, all right. <laughs> and I think you're in the right place. I think you're at, at Baptist Bible College. But the book's not written yet on the second question. And that can sabotage, quite frankly, any abilities you have to, to make it in ministry. It's a, it's a very vital decision. So let me ask you this. We all know Pastor Ray Adams, don't we? Professor Ray Adams. I went to school with, with Ray. And trust me, he didn't get to where he was by himself. He married way up. Beth is incredible, all right? He would be a hard man to stay married to, all right? <laughs> But God gave him just the right wife. Dr. Milioni, trust me, he'd be a washout if he didn't have Barb. <laughs> right? He's got his little Barbie doll, and there they go. They're, they're together and all that. But he wouldn't make it. I'm as, I'm as dead serious as I can possibly be. He would not make it without her. So, God consciousness. Is that how we do it nowadays in this culture? Do single people in our culture usually ask God for help to find the best mate for their lives before they begin dating? Some do. Most don't. If God's consulted, a lot of times it's just kind of like an afterthought. You get serious and, hey, God, why don't you kind of approve, put your stamp of approval. God, I believe this is the person for me. We kind of inform him about it. The general practice of courtship in our culture is kind of like we're adrift and then until something just happens, we run into just the person and then we are kind of have this appeal to, to be near them and so forth and it begins to get more and more. But I want to say this, that if God is not drawn in at the outset of a romantic involvement, the results could be disastrous. Once again, I went to BBC back in the Stone Age when they had dinosaurs roaming the earth, and we had the highest population of, of students, over 2,500 students at BBC. And there were lots of guys in our class that divorced and never made it in ministry. And there are greater men and women than any person that sits in this room that ruins their life because of compromising in, in physical relationships before they're supposed to, to happen. Make that a priority to make yourself pure. Ask God, God, who should I marry? Ask him, should I be dating this person? Do you realize that some of your parents have been praying for you from the day you were born that you wouldn't marry the right person? Secondly, if you're single, the second principle to finding God's best for your life is to look for the right person in the right place. 
As I told you before already, I believe you're in a great place to find a spouse. Abraham told his servant, he said this, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. I don't know what Abraham didn't like about the Canaanite women. But there was something that was wrong with those girls, weren't there? The situation was terrible in their land and there was so much immorality that they would fall into that same immorality themselves. The point is that you can find the wrong, in the wrong place, you can find the wrong person very easily. You go, why am I telling you guys that? Ministry is about endurance. It's about perseverance. It's not, it's not a short 50 meter run, it's a, it's a marathon. And it is very vital that you stay in college, that you don't just stay a year or two and then transfer over to OTC. You don't think I know about OTC. I grew up here. Hello, you know. It's easy to, to bail on the situation and you put yourself in a place that you might not marry the best person. Does that mean there aren't Christians over there? No, but their focus isn't the same as what we do here. We're about conquering the world. We're about winning people to Christ. We go into those kind of environments and all of a sudden we find ourselves in places that we shouldn't be. Thirdly, not only are the right places to look for godly spouses, there are also right qualities to be looking for in a potential mate. This is probably the most important part of the suggestions I'd like to give you this morning. Often it isn't until we're older that we realize the value of being raised in a godly home. When we get up two years and have children, then we realize how our parents' love for each other was very important to us. I have seven staff members at my church. I am the only one who come from a family that both the mother and the father are still together. All of my staff have parents who've been divorced. That is more the rule than the exception in today's culture. So it's harder to find someone that we can rest on in those kind of ideas. Find someone <coughs> with the right qualities. Someone wrote, Dear Abby, she said, Dear Abby, I'm 44 and I'd like to meet a man my age with no bad habits, signed Rose. Abby wrote back, Dear Rose, so would I. <laughs> the question is, how do people generally decide to date someone? Now, when you think about that, the first answer, if you're plugged in with me, is the way somebody looks. Am I right? Somebody say amen. amen. I don't think God wants you to date the ugliest person on planet Earth, all right? I think he wants you to be attracted to them. Somebody else say amen with that, amen? amen. According to one poll, 40% of Americans say that they believe in love at first sight, kind of like the story I told with Mindensal. In our culture, people are elevated on how they look, how, how well they kiss and whether or not they can carry on the conversation long enough to keep the other person interested to get to the kissing again. <laughs> that's not always true, but it's true enough to know that that's a recipe for disappointment. Our country has had the highest divorce rate for the past 50 years. Why? Partly it's because Hollywood and the culture of our day propagates the thought that looks is all that counts in a relationship. It is actually the least of the things that will hold us together. It's interesting that in Isaac's culture, there was almost no emphasis on physical beauty. Now, not completely, mind you. The Bible tells us that Rebecca was very beautiful, verse 16 of chapter 24. But notice the first thing that Rebecca does when she sees Isaac. She says these words to the servant. Who is the man in the field coming to meet us? The servant says, he's my master. So she veiled and covered herself. Now check this out. In that culture, it was improper for the husband to see the bride before they were married, to see her face. In fact, the custom carries over into our day when women wear a veil down, down the, what is that called? The aisle. Yeah, that's it. Now you can still see through it. You can still see who you're marrying. But in that day... Most of the time, there, there's a lot of theologians who believe that Isaac never even knew what she looked like until after the ceremony. Now, how would you like that one? <laughs> wow, that's scary to think about, isn't it? 
Looks on the in outside are very important, but looks on the inside are even more important. Now, we, we talked about just ask God, God, is this the right one that you want me to marry? But I'd like to ask you to say, God, is what I'm doing with this relationship honoring to you also? Could I offer you some advice about picking a potential soulmate for your ministry? If you involve yourself in any kind of immoral relationships before you are married, the chances are that you will never make it in the ministry. Overwhelming chances. It will not only short circuit your marriage, but it will short, short, short circuit your ministry also. Think about King David. His life was going up, up, up until he hit a gal whose name was... Yeah. And you look at his life from that point on. It goes down, down, down. Now God still uses imperfect people. I'm happy to say that for all of us, aren't we? But God would a lot rather use a clean vessel than a dirty vessel. Consider what the servant's prayer was when he was asking God for the right girl. He said these words, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. Show me kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here at the well of the water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I, say, whom I shall say, let thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she say, drink, and I will give to thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that has appointed for my servant Isaac. And therefore shall I know that thou hast shown mercy unto my master. Notice that he doesn't say, Lord, give me the best looking gal in the, in the pack. He doesn't talk anything about that. He's, now he's looking, he's saying, Lord, give me somebody who will not just give me water, but will also water my camels. Do you know how much a camel drinks? A thirsty camel will drink 21 gallons of water. In the ancient day, you didn't draw it up five gallons at a time. You draw it up a half a gallon at a time. Each gallon weighs five pounds. 21 gallons, do the math, times 10 camels. That's over a half a ton of water that she's drawing. She is way over any kind of courtesy kind of draw here of a drink of water. Why was she doing this? Because he was looking for a person who had a servant's heart, who would care about that person. That she wouldn't spend all her time, excuse me, always looking in the mirror, all right? She was caring and doing the work of the day. And this is a joint effort that we do in ministry together. She was going to be the type who pleased her husband. Does that sound a little bit chauvinistic in our society? It, it does, doesn't it? Can I remind you that the Apostle Paul writes to God's people that a married woman is to be concerned, and one of the things that it was is about how she could please her husband, 1 Corinthians 7, 34, look it up yourself. And that's one where a lot of times guys go, well, amen, amen, let them be a servant. But I might, might I remind you that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, 28, that the Bible says that a husband ought to love his wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It also goes on to tell how that he ought to love his wife as he loves his own body. And he loves his wife, and it says he who loves his wife loves himself. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. Don't marry somebody who's selfish that are always thinking about themselves. You see, Isaac's servant had it right. Marry someone who will care about others. And maybe they'll care about you a little bit too in the process. But those are the qualities that, that they are looking for in a spouse. The right place to find a place. The right qualities. Let me offer one last bit of advice this morning is that you make a list of the qualities that you're looking for in a spouse. I heard a story about a, a young man who, who had trouble dating. I relate to this, all right? And uh, so he went to work after Bible college as an intern in a church, and the pastor asked him, are you ever going to get married? He said, well, I, I hope so. He goes, you ever prayed and asked God 
about giving you a spouse? And he goes, yeah, I do it all the time. Well, he said, have you, ever, have you ever asked God about what kind of spouse you're looking for? And the young man was kind of taken back, insulted. Why, well, certainly I have, he said. But he hardly knew he hadn't. So he went back and make a, made a list of five or six things, not very long, because he's already having a hard time finding a date, all right? Rather than make a long list, he's made a short list. <laughs> And after he did that, he was very comfortable with, comfortable with himself because he knew what he was looking for in a spouse. He didn't date for three years. He graduated from Bible college. He went back to his home church. His dad was a Sunday school superintendent. He began to teach Sunday school. Three years later, a gal came to visit the church who was the friend of the, daughter's, uh, the, the pastor's daughter's uh, friend. And when he saw her and the qualities that she had, because she didn't just come for church, she came for Sunday school, he fell immediately in love with her. And she fell in love with the single youth pastor instead. But that didn't bother him. That gave him time for him to catch her eye. And within a year, they were married. Why? Because when God showed that person up on the scene, he knew what God wanted him to have in the person that he was looking for. And then it was like a natural falling in love together between the two. You see, if you trust God and seek his ways and follow these biblical principles that I give you, then help me to understand that God will give you the right person to help you accomplish the ministry that you have together. Now, let me be as honest as I possibly can. And Brother Rick, you help me with this. When you were married in what year? 1957, two years after I was born. He's been married a long, long time, all right? Did you know what you were doing? No. I had no clue what I was doing either. I'll be honest with you. It's by the grace of God that any of us stay married. It is. So I'm saying this, that if Brother Blue, myself, if we would confess to you and the other married people in this room, you would probably say, no clue, no clue. You know, the thing that would help us out that would make our marriages successful is that we, we were tied to a person who had a clue. That was God. And he helped us in making those decisions. We made him through these biblical practices and God honored our relationships together. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, Matthew 6, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now let me break that down just a little bit in this kind of a context. Put God for it, have, have a God consciousness and his righteousness. Live moral lives. Christians ought to be a, a, we ought to be a source of, of help to the world. And if we live in immorality, we can't help. And, and, and it says, in his righteousness. And then it says this, and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe this especially includes the life-changing decisions concerning who your soulmate will be for the rest of your life. You know what the world teaches? The world teaches us that a good marriage is finding the right person. You know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches that a key to a good marriage is being the right person. And the key to being the right person is pleasing the Lord. And God will supply the desires of your heart. Would you bow with me?